Hello dear students, I am Dr. Savita Kaushal from Nupa, Delhi. This module is on researching pioneer competencies in India. Objectives of this module are introduction to the pioneer and pioneer competencies, understanding attributes of Nobel laureates, recalling Nobel laureates of India and researching pioneer competencies in India. This module also intends to acquaint you with the problem addressed by the different pioneers. Let us first try to understand the fact that who is a researcher and who is a pioneer. A researcher is one who is fully lost in quest of solutions to the problem around the clock through humanistic and scientific approach irrespective of the discomfort. So you underline the word discomfort over here. A pioneer is noblest number one innovator who identifies with the universe holistically a pioneer germinates, incubates, innovates, creates and constructs. A pioneer is round the clock lost in sensing, formulating and addressing developmental changes through most innovative, creative, constructive and connectionist approaches. Pioneer is a unique excellent innovator who intends to be close to the creator on the object of quest as already stated, germination, incubation, innovation, creation, construction and connection are the essential attributes of a pioneer who is lost in the quest round the clock with positive attitude despite all the discomforts. The marvelous mysteries and deep secrets of the nature are revealed when a researcher is fully lost in the quest. It is in tune with Swami Vivekananda vision and determination that arise, awake and stop not till the goal is reached. The ultimate goal is a perfect becoming with skill, scale and speed. Constructivist, connectionist and naturalists are proud of their creation, always humble, a holistic being and embodiment of the soul, having perfect entertainment of heart and also brain, senses, motor muscles, resonating self with the environment, a universal being with unconditional eternal love and affection for all. A pioneer is curious. He is also determined, dedicated, committed, eternal scholar with a unique profile. Noble laureates may not be roaring IQ, but they are highly goal-oriented, dedicated people who fully strive for finding the truth and reality let us examine some of the Nobel laureates of India because how to research the pioneer competencies is beyond the conceptual framework, theoretical framework, propositions, methodology, tool and techniques. We need to have a knowledge base regarding the Nobel laureates. That is why we are uh, examining some of the uh, some of the Nobel laureates of India and we'll be understanding the, uh, the contributions of these uh, people one by one. And uh, to begin with, let us first examine the contribution of Sri Rabindranath Tagore. Rabindranath Tagore, India's popular poet and writer, was awarded Nobel Prize for Literature in 1913 for Gitanjali. Gitanjali is a collection of his poems. Uh, you'll be surprised to know that his compositions were selected as national anthem by two nations, that is India and this you already know, Janagan Man and Bangladesh, that is Omar Shonal, Bangla. As an advocate of the Bengal Renaissance, he advanced a vast canon that comprised paintings, sketches and doodles, hundreds of texts and some 2000 songs. His legacy endures also in Vishwabharti, the institution he founded. Tego modernized Bengali art by spawning rigid classical forms and resisting linguistic structures. His novels, stories, songs, dance dramas and essays spoke to topics and also about uh, topics were varied that is um, uh, uh, political and personal and his verse, short stories and novels were highly praised for their lyricism, colloquialism, naturalism and unnatural contemplation. Some sources even state that the national anthem of Sri Lanka was also written by Tagore, while some others state it was inspired by the work of Tagore. 
Now, let us examine the contribution of Sri Chandrasekhar Venkatraman, who is also popularly known as C. V. Raman. Chandrasekhar Venkataraman, an Indian scientist in 1922, published his work on the molecular diffraction of light. The first of a series of investigations with his collaborators, which ultimately led to his discovery on the 28th February 1928 of the radiation effect which bears his name. Within two years and five months of the discovery, 385 papers, how big the number is, and five special monographs were published. The Nobel Committee was of the opinion that Raman established the universal character of the effect by investigating a large number of solids and liquids. This helped him to get a Nobel Prize in physics. He received the Nobel Prize in a record time of two years after the discovery. He was awarded Nobel Prize of Physics in 1930 for his Raman effect related to the light. Discovery of the effect was hailed by an American physicist of that time, great physicist. His name is R. W. Wood. He stated that it was one of the best convincing proofs of the quantum theory. Due to the simplicity of the apparatus, the application of the discovery in the field of experimental and theoretical physics grew rapidly. Other investigations carried out by Raman were his experimental and theoretical studies on the diffraction of light by acoustic waves of ultrasonic and hypersonic frequencies. And this was published in the years 1934 to 1942. And those on the effects produced by X-rays on infrared vibrations in crystals exposed to ordinary light. In 1948, Raman, through studying the spectroscopic behavior of the crystals, approached in a new manner fundamental problems of crystal dynamics. His laboratory was dealing with the structure and properties of diamond, the structure and optical behavior of numerous iridescent substances, labradorite, pearl, agate and opal. Among his other uh, interests were the optics of collides, electrical and magnetic anistropy and the physiology of human vision. Now, let us go through the contribution of Dr. Hargobind Khurana. Dr. Hargobind Khurana was an Indian American biochemist. He was India's doctorate in chemistry. He was awarded Nobel Prize for Medicine in 1968 for his study of human genetic code and its role in protein synthesis. One interesting in incident about Dr. Hargobind Khurana is that he simply showed up in the laboratory of Dr. Vladimir Prelog in Zurich with no recommendations and pleaded for a little space to do postdoctoral research under him. Moreover, his determination and tenacity to learn the German language well introduced him to the world of a class of chemical reagents called carbodimides, which proved pivotal for much of the, uh, his early work on the synthesis of nucleotides, nucleotide co coenzymes, and the first synthesis of a gene. And he ended up in Vancouver, Canada for his first position as an independent investigator. He shared the 1968 Nobel Prize for Physiology or Medicine with uh, Marshall W. Vernarenberg and Robert W. Holley for research that helped to show the order of nucleotides in nucleic acids, which carry the genetic code of the cell, control the cell synthesis of proteins. Kurana and Narenberg were also awarded the Loisa Gross Howitz Prize from Columbia University in the same year. Kurana was the first scientist to chemically synthesize oligonucleotides. Now, let us discuss another well known Nobel Prize laureate that is Mother Teresa. Mother Teresa, a Yugoslavian nun who became an Indian citizen, was awarded Nobel Prize for Peace in 1979 for her service through her charitable mission, Nirmal Hide at Calcutta to people suffering from leprosy and to those people dying in the destitute. When she was young, Mother Teresa learned that the absence of material things did not necessarily impair the capacity for happiness. What are your thoughts about this? 
how is Mother Teresa's outlook on possessions different from the outlook displayed by many people today? It's quite different. Mother Teresa had first been recognized by the Indian government more than a third of a century earlier when she was awarded the Padma Shri in 1962 and Jawaharlal Nehru Award for International Understanding in 1969. She continued to receive major Indian awards in subsequent years, including India's highest civilian award, the Bharat Ratna, in 1980. Her official biography was written by an Indian civil servant, Naveen Chawla, and it was published in the year 1992. Mother Teresa had been bestowed many awards, topped by the Nobel Peace Prize in 1979. Other awards included honorary scholars or doctorates by many universities and large cash prizes. She never considered any of these prizes and cash awards as personal property but merely accepted them in the name of poor and spent every cent of them on the poor only. On 28 August 2010, to commemorate the 100th anniversary of her birth, the government of India issued a special 5 rupee coin being the sum she first arrived in India with. President Pratibha Patil said of Mother Teresa, clad in a white sari with a blue border, she and the sisters of missionaries of charity became a symbol of hope to many. The aged, the destitute, the unemployed, the diseased and terminally ill, and also to the, those who were abandoned by their families. Let us now examine the contribution of another Nobel Prize winner, Dr. Subramanian Chandrasekhar. Dr. Subramanian Chandrasekhar, an Indian astrophysicist, was awarded Nobel Prize for Physics in 1983 for his theory on white dwarf stars limitation known as Chandrasekhar limit. In recognition of his well-known work on the internal operation and life cycle of stars such as sun and for his development of the new radiation heat transfer and fluid flow analysis techniques, Dr. Chandrasekhar was indeed chosen as the Abbott Award recipient for the year 1991. Dr. Chandrasekhar was especially pleased to be chosen as Abbott Award recipient because the solar measurements of Abbott had been critical in the work done many years earlier in determining the composition of the sun. This in turn had made it possible to determine how the sun produced solar energy he wrote that his scientific research was motivated by his desire to participate in the progress of different subjects in science to the best of his ability and that the prime motive underlying his work was systematization. What a scientist tries to do essentially is to select a certain domain, a certain aspect or a certain detail and see if that takes its appropriate place in a general scheme which has form and coherence and if not to seek further information which would help him to do that. Chandrasekhar developed a unique style of mastering several fields of physics and astrophysics. Consequently, his working life can be divided into distinct periods. He would exhaustively study a specific area, publish several papers in it and then write a book. That was his characteristics and that book would summarize the major concepts in the field. He would then move on to another field for the next decade and repeat the pattern. Thus, he studied stellar structure including the theory of white drafts during the years 1929 to 1939 and subsequently he also focused on stellar dynamics from 1939 to 1943. Next, he concentrated on the theory of radiative transfer and the quantum theory of the negative ion of hydrogen from 1943 to 1950. This was followed by a sustained work on hydrodynamic and hydromagnetic stability from 1950 to 61. In the 1960s, he studied the equilibrium and the stability of ellipsoidal figures of 
uh, equilibrium and also general relativity. During this period that is 1971 to 1983, he studied the mathematical theory of black holes. And finally, during the late 80s, he worked on the theory of colliding gravitational waves. Now, let us discuss the contribution of uh, Dr. Amartya Sen. Uh, Dr. Amartya Sen is an Indian professor in economics and he was awarded Nobel Prize for Economics in 1998 for his work in economic theory related to the poverty, democracy, development and social welfare. With his Nobel Prize award money, Dr. Amartya Sen has set up the Pratichi Trust which carries out research, advocacy and experimental projects on basic education, primary health care and women's development in West Bengal and Bangladesh. Professor Sain himself took active interest in his work helping set the agenda, looking at the evidence from research and engaging in advocacy. Sain's significant findings and insightful observations and recommendations have relevance much beyond West Bengal. After this, Venkat Raman, Ramakrishnan and Indo-American has shared Nobel Prize for Chemistry along with a co-American Thomas Sheds and Ada Yunath of Israel in 2009 for mapping ribosomes, the protein procuring factories within cells at the atomic level. Ramakrishnan was born in Chidambaram in Kadalu district of Tamil Nadu, India to C. V. Ramakrishnan and Rajalakshmi. Both his parents were scientists and taught biochemistry at Maharaja Sayajara University in Baroda 1971. He moved to Baroda in Gujarat at the age of three, where he had his schooling except for the period from the year 1960 to 61 in Adelaide, Australia. Following his pre-science study at Maharaja Syajarao University of Baroda, he did his undergraduate studies in the same university on a National Science Talent Fellowship, graduating with a B.Sc. degree in Physics in 1971. In a lecture in January 2010 at the Indian Institute of Science, he revealed that he failed to get admitted to any of the Indian Institutes of Technology or even the Christian Medical College, Velo, Tamil Nadu. Immediately after graduation, he moved to the USA where he obtained his PhD degree in Physics from Ohio University in 1976. He then spent two years studying biology as a graduate student at the University of California, San Diego, while making a transition from theoretical physics to biology. Ramakrishnan began work on ribosomes as a postdoctoral fellow with Peter Moore at Yale University. After his postdoctoral fellowship, he initially could not find a faculty position, even though he had applied to about 50 universities in the US. He continued to work on ribosomes from 1983 to 1995 as a staff scientist at Brookhaven National Laboratory. In 1995, he moved to the University of Utah as a professor of biochemistry. And in 1999, he moved to his current position at Medical Research Council Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge, England, where he had also been a sabbatical visitor during 1991-92. In 1999, Ramakrishnan's laboratory published a 5.5 angstrom resolution structure of the 30S subunit. Uh, the following year, his laboratory determined the complete molecular structure of the 30S subunit of the ribosome and its complexes with several antibiotics. This was followed by studies that provided structural insights into the mechanism that ensures the fidelity of protein biosynthesis. More recently, his laboratory has determined the atomic structure of the whole ribosome in complex with its tRNA and mRNA ligands. Ramakrishnan is also known for his past work on histone and chromatin structure. So, students, now let us discuss the contribution of uh, Shri Kailash Satyarthi. In 2014, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to educational rights campaigner uh, Kailash Satyarthi. He shared the 2014 award with uh, Malala Yousafzai. 
and uh, Satyati had maintained the tradition of Mahatma Gandhi and headed various forms of peaceful protest, focusing on the grave exploitation of children for financial gain. The life and work of Mr. Kailash at Satyarthi is synonymous to the never-ending crusade against child slavery. Born in 1954 in Vidisha district of Madhya Pradesh, a state in central India, he has a degree in electrical engineering and a postgraduate diploma in high voltage engineering. While teaching as a professor in college in Bhopal, Mr. Satyarthi decided to work more actively for social change. Along with a set of friends, he founded Bachpan Bachao Andolan, which is popularly known as BBA, and it was established in the year 1980. BBA symbolizes the struggle against the child labor and also child servitude. The organization is also the initiator of the first regional South Asian People's Movement, the South Asian Coalition on Child Servitude, a conglomeration of more than 750 civil society organizations. Till date, the BBA team has led to the rescue and withdrawal of nearly 80,000 children who were bonded laborers and developed a successful model for their education and rehabilitation. In 1998, Mr. Satyarthi organized the Global March Against Child Labor across 103 countries and it had a participation of over 7.2 million people and 20,000 civil society organizations. It is the largest people's campaign on child labor that led to ILO convention on the worst forms of child labor. It has been successful in formation of global task force on child labor and education, which is a working committee of UN agencies and for policy coherence and concerted actions on child labor, elimination, education for all and poverty elevation. The education initiative led by Mr. Satyarthi is a coalition of civil society networks, foundations and teachers, associations campaigning for the implementation of darker goals of education for all through international advocacy and lobbying work. As an analytical thinker, Mr. Satyarthi has been the pioneer advocate of the now established triangular paradigm of development interlinking child labor, elimination and poverty, eradication with the education for all. He is combating the use of child labor by creating domestic and international consumer resistance to products made by children in bonded labor. In 1994, he started Rugmark, a social labeling program in which rugs are labeled and certified to the child labor free by factories that agree to be regularly inspected. He has promoted the empowerment of children through the formation of Bal Mitra Grams, uh, popularly known as child friendly villages. The concept of Bal Mitra Gram is an innovative approach towards total elimination of child labor and universalization of education. Children's Village Council has evolved to enhance community awareness and participatory democracy and has been an unprecedented success. Mr. Satyarthi at the age of 60 is closer to the average age of a Nobel laureate and he has spent decades building a global campaign for children's rights which was initiated in India in 1980s in the fight against child labor. Now let us examine the problems that were addressed by the pioneers. There are many developmental challenges for India, such as uh, assimilating the globalization, managing knowledge, continuous updating of knowledge and skills, creating new age institutions, balancing materialism and values, use of resources, working with multiple languages and multiple cultures meeting the climatic and environmental challenges, sustaining development, collaborative living, holistic development, developing vocational skills, enhancing communication skills, quality control, removing public-private dichotomy, controlling rising materialistic value, realizing even distribution, controlling ecological imbalances, 
fair recognition, valid accreditation, sustaining symbiosis, respecting cultural heritage, sustaining sensitivity to the basic values, convergence of state, society, education and judiciary, respecting rights of all and also transcending time, space and mind. There is infinite universe and beyond yet to be explored. India which had the grace of being contented, peaceful, healthy, happy, beauteous and culture society is moment by moment losing its natural bliss and beauty. We have become insensitive to our own Indian heritage of peaceful struggle. Each one of us needs to recreate revive and refresh ourselves holistically to value our heritage and build a strong, powerful, cultured, dedicated and pioneer India. From this discussion, we can conclude that some of the attributes of noble laureates of India are they have a passion and dedication, they believe in simple living and high thinking, they fully identify with the objects of their quest. All of them are universal becoming. They are intensively connectionist. They have a wonderful sensitivity and skill of scanning. They try their level best to transcend time, space, mind and self. They are fully lost in the realization of their goal, are regulating both in vivo and external. They really aspire for awards and rewards. Their acts and texts have own testimony. They realize quality and perfection with every bit of action. They live alone in and with the crowd. They are goal oriented around the clock. Uh, they try to set all the systematic parameters with them in perfect resonance. Irrespective of the discipline they are identified with, they are ultimately spiritual scientists. Basically, the intent of the present module was on mapping the competencies of the pioneers and trying to emulate these to address numerous problems so as to recreate and reform this sphere as a happy, healthy, peaceful abode for all. The focus was on recalling Nobel laureates of India and researching pioneer competencies in India. It is really surprising to learn someone else telling of our problems. Let us learn to identify and identify with our own problems and address these indigenously. We need to be smart, scientific, humanistic, cheerful players. Let us exercise and realize our potentials. India will have to revive its cultural heritage and modernize socially, logically, scientifically, technically and transcend the space, time and mind to realize its status of Jagat Guru. For that, let us learn to activate and respect the self. The universe has revelations in many varied forms. There is no space, no spot, no dot in the universe which is problem independent. Even vacuum is in problem. How to justify the existence of every entity, their interconnection, their occurrence of various phenomena? The question is that of identification with the universe. But in this flight of identification, no thesis, howsoever comprehensive and precise, is ultimate. We are degrees of a domain and discipline. No one is perfect 100% in internalizing the universe with. The question is, how big and substantive is our knowledge base? With the efforts of all the generation, we still have a very little knowledge base of universe. It is because identification with the universe demands round the clock quest, holistic, systematic research with full, full dedication, independent of all the noises and with capacity of understanding and connecting the interplay of many various varied variables. The pioneers in various disciplines have very well demonstrated the identification, but where do we stand? in understanding the reality we are. The reality is independent of all of us who try to investigate it. And how a sub subjective in investigator can have objective view of the reality? It demands infinite, rather indeterminate arrays of abilities, 
capabilities, skills and competences to reach the reality. There are various challenges and conditions which are limiting the quest. Scientific realism is too meek to capture the reality. But there have been sages, then spiritual scientists along with physical scientists to provide and activate the strength and power of soul within and between us. It is true that there is only one cause and all the rest are effects. So it is impossible by the effect to have intelligibility of the cause comprehensively. The pioneering and innovative research in the form of constructions and connections, though very limited, but it's very enlightening. To conclude, I would like to say that let us search and research and find ourselves and basic culture through pioneering striving. Where are we lost? We ought to find our own selves. Challenge for us today is to develop a pioneer culture. Developmental challenges demand pioneers with interdisciplinary competences. How long we compromise with the fragmented research? Should it not be holistic? Why the scientists have not come out of the laboratories? Is not that uh, there is a need to conduct naturalistic situational research through deep observation, reflection and intuition and construct grassroots theories addressing our problems through our tools, through our sources and resources to better our uh, quality of life and living. With these few questions for you to ponder on, I conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you.